This is the Daily Dispatch podcast with your business correspondent, Ted Keenan. Today, Dispatch Live is talking to... Justin Chadwick is the Chief Executive Officer of the South African Citrus Growers Association. Justin, you say that SA is probably the biggest citrus producer in the world and is certainly the biggest supplier of lemons. However, while that sounds like brilliant news, there are several challenges to the industry, not least of which is the freight charges and the challenges by the European Union, driven by Spain, which are setting out several hurdles that you believe are not necessary to try and jump over. Your thoughts on this? So apart from the climate and the, and the water, etc., the other thing that this region has is, is fantastic ports. Um, we don't export out of East London, but we do export out of uh, Kucha, and we have in the past out of Kuberga. Um, and you know, as you all know, Kucha is a, is a world-class port. It's, it's very recently been built. Um, and so the equipment, etc., is, is pretty new. Um, there's fantastic cold store facilities um, for keeping the, the fruit cool. Um, and and uh, Transnet operating this port here have done exceptionally well um, over this 22 season to get all the fruit through. So for sure, um, the Eastern Cape is, 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 is a citrus powerhouse in the world, um, not only in South Africa, but Southern Africa. Um, that's not to say that there aren't challenges, um, not, and these challenges aren't peculiar to, to the Eastern Cape. They are challenges that we're facing as an industry, um, and in fact, our competitors are facing similar challenges from Peru or South America and, and Australia. And, and the, the biggest challenge is, is on freight rates, um, the cost of actually shipping the fruit from South Africa to, to the destinations. Uh, we're the longest distance exporter in the world. Um, you just think about us in the tip of Africa exporting to Europe, Russia, Middle East, etc. Um, and unfortunately, freight rates um, for all goods have just gone up sometimes fourfold in some routes. And it's, it's, it's 40% of our cost structure. So you can imagine if your 40% of your cost structure goes up four times, mm. it actually makes us unsustainable and, and in survival mode at the moment. So that's, that's critical that we address that. Um, and then there are other issues like the EU false coddling moth regulations. Um, and today is actually an incredibly important day. I don't know how many of you realize, but this is the first time South Africa has ever entered a WTO dispute, um, which is happening today in Geneva, the consultations. Um, and so we're really hopeful that that will bring about some change to, to what the, we d- regard as disproportionate and, and unjustified measures from, from the EU. Um, I also want to just in, uh, add inclusivity. You know, there's the agriculture master plan. I think Wandeli Shishlova might be um, discussing that at, at the symposium, um, which has been uh, developed by the, the Department of Agriculture and, and, um, uh, and Industry. And that's the whole thrust of the master plan is around uh, inclusive growth. So we see the growth, but do we see the inclusivity? And I think that's a big challenge for, for all of us, government and industry, to ensure that we get more black growers into our industry. And, um, and in fact, the Eastern Cape's got a fantastic uh, group of, of exporting black growers. Um, and and it's, it's actually the biggest group that we have in the country. Uh, and unfortunately, with the circumstances now in terms of the margins that I was talking about, it does impact on, on smaller scale wow. growers more than, than the larger growers who have reserves and, and, um, and have built up uh, networks, etc. So we really need to give them additional support. We have a CGA grower development company that, um, uh, that focuses on, on, on that activity. Um, and we work very closely with the Department of Rural Development and Agricultural um, in in uh, in the Eastern Cape, we've got an agreement with them, and um, we're obviously trying to give us grow as much support as possible. Are we going to win in the EU with Spain driving this? The second question: How important is Eastern Cape to the citrus market? Are we a big player? Are there players that are bigger than us? 
Okay, so so the first question: Are we going to win? Um, I think in in any legal dispute, um, it's a very brave man who says that, or lady who says they're definitely going to win. So so we we believe the case is extremely strong, um, and we have. Um, so what the government did was join the advisory centre for WTO law, the ACWL, a few years, well, probably about ten years ago. Um, and what that does is it gives a developing countries access to Geneva lawyers at reasonable rates, because otherwise you can imagine every dispute, the country with the most money and the best lawyers would, would win the case. So, so, so we're members of the ACWL, and so we've got really good lawyers in Geneva. Um, so that's the first part. Um, um, the second part is we've got our own trade lawyers, and then we've got um, uh, industry export or, or um, uh, experts on the actual technical side. So we've got a, quite a strong team in Geneva, along with Department of, of Agriculture and with DTIC. Um, we've also got strong people there. Um, we believe the case is strong. The, the ACWL lawyers believe that we've got a very strong case. Um, and what the hope is is that when the two countries get together in this consultation, that one party realizes that the other's got a stronger case, and then they look for a compromise. Mm. So it's it's doubtful that the that the regulation itself will be taken off the table because you can imagine the reaction from Spain then in 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 they probably drive tractors into Madrid and all sorts of things. So <laughs> um, that's what they do. So, um, so 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 they'll come to some compromise where the where the measure remains, but they allow various uh, different aspects of it to be tinkered with, which will then allow us to to be able to export. I think the, the the most important thing is we, we the, the growers in South Africa invest 150 million rand a year into research. And now that's a lot of money, and and as a result, we've got seriously good technical people working in in the industry. And we developed a false coaling moth management system, which is uh, seen around the world as the most advanced. In that, it only at, um, addresses the risk of a consignment of fruit. So what the what the EU have decided is that we have to cold steer all the fruit. Uh, cold treat all the fruit. So that wastes energy, uh, firstly, because now you've got all these cooling chambers and we know what happens with, with load shedding and et cetera, which, which is a problem there as well. Um, and it excludes organic fruit immediately, which is a big thrust from the EU trying to get us to, to, to produce more organic fruit. But organic is not um, doesn't have waxing and various other stuff that protects it against the cold. So, so, so you exclude that, that immediately. Um, and, and so all of those aspects come into play um, with a, with a, with a cold treatment. Um, so we're hoping that that in the discussions we'll be able to 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 bring some sort of um, um, recognition of the uh, of our management system as being appropriate and giving them liable level of protection. And then your question about the Eastern Cape. Um, uh, I'll show in my presentation later, but I think this this province. Well, I know this province. Pres produces more than 40% of our lemons and is growing. So if you look at our lemons and our mandarins, most of the trees are under five years old or six years old, which means they're not even into full production yet. So there's the, the potential for this province to grow even further is immense. Um, there, there's going to be massive volumes, which is either a disaster or the best story ever. So it's a disaster if we can't get our, our logistics to keep up with it and if we can't find the markets out there to, to open up new markets for this additional product, it's it's it, it, you know so, so and it could be a fantastic story if we manage to export all of that that additional fruit. So, will we beneficiate that product before it goes out? The, the most money you make out of a piece of fruit is selling it fresh. Yeah. Um, so so yes, you can be, you can process, and we've got some agri um, uh, citrus processing yeah. plants in the Eastern Cape. But seriously, they, they don't make money. Um, <laughs> the money is in the, in the fresh fruit. It, it, it could be that if you got the processing a bit better, um, because remember, we, because we produce for fresh, we, we, we treat it with various um, plant protection products, etc. So it's not great for juicing because, it, you know, you now got to, uh, those, those contaminants perhaps in your juice um, because the whole fruit is juiced. Remember, the whole fruit is is taken in there. So 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 you'd farm differently. <coughs> Brazil um a juice ninety five percent of their fruit and they produce just for juice. So so they don't they don't treat their orchards um it's you know they just keep the, the fruit on the tree until it's big enough and juicy enough to give them juice. If we had if we had to go into juicing in a big way we would change our farming practices. Yeah. It'd be a lot cheaper and then it would make economic sense to juice more. But um so it's not really a great uh, um um, op opportunity, but it is something we need to look at because 
we're so beholden to the export market that if something happens, we've got no alternatives. And so we do need to look at it. Can I, can I perhaps add to that? So, so the reason why we can't send to the USA is a phytosanitary issue. So it's yeah. a citrus black spot. Um, and, and sitting on the Secretary of Agriculture's desk for the last four years mm -hmm. is the wider access yeah. to the USA for, for areas like this. Sure. And, and all it needs is a signature. It's gone through all the technical. There's no, there's no technical stuff that's on it back. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a purely political thing, and it's all got to do with pork. So, oh. so because we won't accept their pork under certain conditions, oh. they won't change our citrus uh, <laughs> application. And it's been sitting like that for, 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 as I say, about four years, and it's a process should take six months, mm -hmm. purely political. So we, we, we're working as hard as you are to get the Eastern Cape and, and, and the Northern provinces into the USA. Yeah. And we've spoken to the importers in the, in the US. There's a, there's a company called Wonderful Citrus, mm -hmm. um, good name. But, uh, and they, they do um, a, a product called Halos, which is a, um, a soft citrus, a fantastic quality, and the, and the sales in the U.S. Are, are, are skyrocketing. In the off-season, they need to keep that, that brand going, and they need Southern Hemisphere citrus. And the only place they can get it from is, is, is Peru and Chile. And our citrus is far superior. They've said so. They've, said they've done tests, and 80% of our citrus meets those requirements. <laughs> Only 40% of Peru and Chile meet those requirements. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so they want our fruit. They're desperate for it. And, uh, and, it, and we are in discussions with Department of Agriculture, DTI, uh, C, and, um, and, and the, the U.S. Embassy, etc., to try and get that um, final rule over the line so we can yeah. get our fruit in from these other provinces. There was talk from one of the major uh, producers of citrus, not in Sunday's River, but Khantus was the other one I think you mentioned. And he was saying even the big guys are under threat at the moment. There is serious worry that they're not going to make any money. But as I think you said earlier, they have got huge reserves. What's going to happen to the smaller guys? And you mentioned black emerging farmers. How will they ride this out? So, so, I mean, we, we got a study done by the Bureau of Food and Agriculture Policy, BFAP, um, that showed that 80% of growers will not make a, will make a loss in 2022. So that just shows you the level of, of, of where the, f the economics are in citrus yeah. farming now. Um, to answer your question shortly, unless things change, they won't. That's the bottom line. I mean, and so that's how serious the absolute. Spanish... Yeah, it's not only this. It's actually freight rates is the biggest problem, to be honest. So, when you so, say, sorry, if yeah, I can interrupt yeah. you, when you speak freight rates, are yeah. we talking rail or no. all freight, road, well, about, rail, no, no, everything? No, no, no. I'm, I'm talking about specifically shipping freight oh, rates. Okay. Yeah. So, so if you look at the likes of of Maersk and MSC and them, they, they've they've hiked their 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 um, their rates up four or five times. Um, so, so it's 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 actually. Um, to give you an example, their, their freight rate to Northwest Continent is 82 Rand a carton now. The whole year of producing a carton of citrus costs 50 Rand. So that just shows you just for that leg now, yeah. the last little leg is, is 80 Rand, almost you know, uh, double uh, the cost of producing, all the cost of producing a, a, a carton of citrus. It's, it's impossible. Does, it, this it's leave impossible. A, does this leave an opening for a local company to go bigger into shipping? We've, um, con we've contracted a, a shipping expert, a world authority on shipping. He, he consults to the New Zealand dairy industry, um, you know, all different industries around the world. Yeah. Said to him, come, we've got to find a solution. The growers all got together and said, look, we either sit that back and do nothing and all die, or we say, what plans can we make and we try and survive? I mean, the shipping companies are massive. You can imagine the MERS and the MSCs mm -hmm. and the Hyperglois and all of them. So he's come in, and the first thing he's, the first answer the question is, is how long is it going to carry on for? You know, when are we going to get back to something called normal? Um, yes. and, and, and that's important because you don't want to make a long term solution for a short term problem. Yes. You know, we go and chart a lot of vessels, and then for the next 10 years, we, we're now paying double the rates that the guys who haven't charted are paying. So, so it's very important. And he's looking at that, and, and it looks like now that by mid year next year, we might be out of the, the, the worst. Um, but we don't know. So he's going to come back with that question by the end of September, by the way. So, so it's not a long, not as if it's going to take forever. Secondly, look at best practices around the world. What, what can we do differently in order to, 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 um, uh, to, to see us through this, this time? What is the best um, plan for 2023? Um, because we're looking ahead to next year. Mm. And, then, and then what he's doing is he's engaging with shipping lines around the world 
Um, he, he's in a position where he can walk into the MD of Maersk and the MD of MSC and sit yeah. with them and say, guys, you're killing the cargo owners. What are you yeah. doing? You know, why are you doing this? And they're killing their own transport as well, eventually. The, the, eventually they'll look around and there'll be no cargo and they've got all these vessels floating in the sea yeah. and nothing to carry. So, so that they should be looking at that, yeah. seriously. Um, and so, so there are various options. So the one option is to try and get another line involved. So you've got MSC and Maersk are the two dominant lines. Maybe there's a third line and he's speaking to people and there are third lines that are interested. They'll come in. Um, we can. But one thing the, gr the industry is going to have to do is to work together closer as well. I mean, everybody thinks they've got a better deal than the guy next door, so they all go and do their own thing. Whereas uh, if we could get all a group of growers together, it doesn't have to be all the growers, but a group of yeah. like-minded people together to contract together, then you've got a critical mass that gives you some level of power now, some level of, 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 of um, negotiating position. So that, you know, we also have to look at ourselves and say, how do we do things differently as well? But the freight rates, to be honest with you, if we sort the freight rates out, these other problems are, are problems, but they're not, they're not um, industry ending problems or, or individual grower ending problems. The, the big issue is the freight rates. If, if we didn't have those huge increases, the guys would still make a margin this year. So the industry is probably in the worst position it's been in for many, many years. However, you've also been in the industry for many, many years. Optimistic? Yeah, so I've been here for 22 years. <laughs> and, and, and definitely it's the worst situation that I've ever seen in the industry in. But I've also seen two things. One is that a lot of these issues are transitionary. You know, so, so, so the war in Russia will come, or war between Russia uh, and Ukraine okay. will come to an end at some point. Yeah. You know, and when that happens, um, fuel prices will come down, fertilizer prices will come down. Um, congestion will, also the other thing is congestion will ease over time. You know, yes, when it'll happen, maybe this year, maybe next year. Um, and then you'll find more containers in, in circulation because only 50% of the containers say are moving at the moment, the rest are standing still. Mm. Um, they're building a whole lot of new containers, et cetera, et cetera. So, so at some point, the, the shipping um, will ease and that should bring um, freight rates down. So I'm just saying all of these things are transitionary and not systemic. They're not built into the system mm. that we're going to see in the future. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, our... Uh, what we're working on, we're not just hoping for, but what we're working on with uh, other stakeholders is to look at when that's going to go away and how do we survive until then. So that's why I say we're in survival mode at the moment, not in a growth, profit-looking mode. Just if the guys can just tread water, get us through these these difficulties, then um, and without too many um, people. Um, falling out of the industry, then we'll be in a position really to take advantage. And remember, our competitors are in the same position. Yeah. So if we can outlast our competitors, maybe we'll be in a better position in the future. Justin, thank you very much for the frank assessment of what is going on with our citrus industry. It's pleasing to hear you are bullish about the future.